1851, Falster Island, Denmark. A 16-year-old musician named Hans is walking home after being the lone musician to play music at a party in a nearby town, something he had been doing since the age of 12. As Hans walked down the street, violin in hand, he overheard a conversation about some American priests who'd come to town. These priests were preaching about a new religion founded in America for which they had just finished translating their religious texts to Danish. This new religion was quite intriguing to Hans and would become the catalyst to greatly change his future, leading him and his siblings to travel over 5,200 miles to build a new life. Hello everybody, I am Jarrett Ross, the Genie Vlogger, and on today's video, I will be discussing Drew Durnell's Mormon Pioneer Ancestry. Drew Durnell is a geography, history, and gaming YouTuber who has been making videos for just over 10 years. I first learned about Drew when I did a reaction to his DNA test results in May of 2021, and then we had the chance to meet while at VidCon in 2022. While at VidCon, I asked Drew what he knew about his family, and while he knew a good bit, it seemed to be somewhat hazy. So I offered to research his tree for the series, and he accepted. He sent me his DNA results in a basic family tree, and then I was off researching. As I was reviewing what he sent me, I quickly noticed something interesting with Drew's tree. When Drew was born, he not only had five great-grandparents still alive, but he also had two second great-grandmothers alive as well. One of those second great-grandmothers was through Drew's purely maternal line, so I decided to ask him what he knew about this line of his family. So I consider myself to be extremely lucky because I was fortunate at a young age to live with both my grandma and her mom, my great grandma. So I was able to obtain a pretty good amount of information, obviously a lot more from my grandma, Linda. Uh, but the basics to her upbringing was that she was born in Salt Lake City and she might have been raised Mormon. I'm still not entirely sure about that one. Uh, but when it comes to, as far as my great-grandma, her mom, this one's a little bit more difficult. I do remember certain things uh, that she would tell me at a young age. I also remember her teaching me a lot about the history of America. I remember hearing about the Mayflower from her. That was probably the first time I'd heard of that ship. She would teach me a little bit uh, just, just about history in general, and maybe that's where... And that honestly might be what sparked my interests. Um, again, I don't know why she was telling like a six or seven year old this stuff, but I guess I find it I found it fascinating and it left an impact. So I know some pieces of information, but obviously I would definitely like to know a lot more. Drew's great grandmother Vera was born on May 18th, 1927 in Salt Lake City to Stanley Pitts Russell and Iva Hattie Weston Scout. Vera's father, Stanley, was a first-generation American, with both of his parents having been born in England. Vera's mother, Iva Hattie, who also went by Hattie or Harriet, was born in Utah in 1907 to John Weston Scow and Susanna Cheshire, the fourth of 11 children. Stanley and Harriet were legally married in Utah in 1928, which I realized their marriage was almost one year after Vera had been born. I couldn't find anything which indicated the deeper story, but I would later learn that it wasn't uncommon for couples from their church to have marriages that were recognized by the church before having their legally civil marriage. Granted, that seemed to be more of a 19th century thing, and I don't know if that was actually the case here. Stanley and Harriet would go on to have two more children, a son and another daughter. Stanley worked as a roof shingler in Salt Lake City, but in the late 1930s, the family moved to Compton in Los Angeles, and Stanley seemed to work various jobs throughout the years. In the 1940s, Stanley was working as a truck driver for Ream Manufacturing Company at their Southgate factory. Then, in a 1942 city directory, he was listed as a shipyard worker, and by 1950, he was back to roofing again. Stanley would pass away in 1972, and Hattie would pass away in 1994, 
just two years after Drew was born. Both of Harriet's parents were born in Utah, which made sense because Drew had told me that he believed this line of the family had been part of the Mormon church. So my next step was to confirm if that was true. Lucky for our research, the Mormon church, or what they prefer to be called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which sometimes just goes by the LDS church, are heavily involved in genealogy. Now this is connected to the LDS church's belief in proxy baptisms, which are basically baptizing already deceased people. So genealogy allows you to build your family tree and baptize your ancestors. The LDS church is also the largest holder of genealogical records in the world, even housing the largest archive of records in a mountain vault known as the Granite Mountain Records Vault. There are census records for church members and membership records, so we can easily see if they were part of the church. Vera's family shows up in these various church records, and I even found Vera in the 1935 church census records this connection to the church likely meant that the family already had an extensive family tree built out. And even more likely, it was being hosted on the church's genealogy website, Family Search. Family Search is a free website which hosts billions of digital records as well as a collaborative family tree. A collaborative family tree means that everyone works from the same family tree. So if two people end up putting the same person in their family trees, that is then merged together. This is actually the same type of thing that Genie.com and Wikitree do as well. But being that Family Search is the LDS Church's website, it has become the central hub of the three collaborative trees with the most information on LDS Church families. I quickly found the family in the Family Search tree, and the amount of information connected to the tree was extremely expansive with photographs and unique records attached. The first thing to catch my eye was that Harriet's paternal grandparents were born in Denmark. So I decided to look further into their story and found that Harriet's grandfather, Hans Olsen Westenskow, Drew's fourth great-grandfather, was a well-documented figure in the LDS church history and had led quite an interesting life. Hans Olsen Westenskow was born on the 17th of September 1835 in a town on Falster Island in Denmark as just Hans Ulesen, Hans the son of Ula. The name Westenskow came from the word Vestenskov, which was something Hans' father Ule had been nicknamed as it roughly meant Western Woods because Ule is said to have lived in the Western Woods of the town. Hans came from a very musical family with his father Ule being a professional musician who taught many on Falster Island, including Hans and his siblings. Hans started learning violin at the age of seven, by age nine he was playing dances alongside his father, and by the age of 12 he was playing parties all by himself. Hans' brother Peter would do the same, with the brothers traveling to neighboring towns to play parties and dances. When Hans was born, his family was part of the Lutheran church. While Hans hadn't been very religious, he did have a few religious experiences in his youth. On one occasion, Hans was walking home from playing a dance in a neighboring town when something all of a sudden overpowered him. It was about a mile away from where I lived. On my way home, it comes to me that I was overpowered of some unseen power which I cannot hear describe. But I did pray earnestly to the Lord for the first time for his help, and my prayer was answered, and it all left me. I have always kept my prayer from that time until this day. There was another story of Hans coming home after a dance and hanging his violin on the wall before going to sleep. His mother and sister were standing next to his bed when they claimed the violin slowly floated up and away from the wall, and then back to the wall, going back and forth three times. They told Hans about this when he woke up, and his mother said that she believed it was a sign from God that he would do something in the music field. In Hans's autobiography, he talks about the first time hearing priests in 1851, and he says, I always believed Mormonism from that time until I embraced it. It wasn't until years later in 1862 that Hans and his brother were baptized into the Mormon church. At that point, Hans had been married for a few years and had a one-year-old son named Ulla. 
Just a year later in 1863, Hans left for Utah with his wife, who was pregnant, and son. Hans's brother Peter had been called to serve in the Danish army to fight Germany over the Schleswig-Holstein region, serving for only 10 weeks but fighting in eight battles. Shortly after Peter finished his service in the army in 1864, he left for America. Their sister Magdalena, who also went by Lena, would join them just a few months later. Something especially important to Lena is she had promised their mother on her deathbed that she would stay with her brothers. While this was all turning out to be quite an interesting story, I wanted to understand the overall history connected to this. So I had a lot of questions to answer. What were Mormon priests doing in Denmark in the 1850s? How long had they been there? By learning the larger history of the area, that might be helpful in understanding Hans' story. So I reached out to Professor Lynn Henriksen from Brigham Young University to help me understand the history a bit better. Hello, my name is Lynn Henriksen. I'm a retired professor of linguistics and English language at Brigham Young University. As you might guess from my last name, Henriksen, I am Scandinavian, Danish. So uh, I've had a, an interest in my Danish ancestry for many years. And that led me to do research on uh, Danish immigrants to Utah. As a uh, language learning teaching professor, I've studied many languages in my career. People always say, you're a linguist, so how many languages do you speak? And linguists don't like that question because most of them speak just one or two and they look at other aspects of language. But I have studied different languages, about nine. The last one of all has been Danish, my ancestral language. And so that began I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And studying that language allowed me to create this specialty on Danish immigrants in the United States. So that's where uh, the connection becomes between linguistics and immigration with these uh, Danish immigrants that came to Utah. My first question for Professor Henriksen was what was the general religious life like in Denmark and how accepted were these Mormon missionaries? Well, traditionally uh, for centuries, uh, Denmark and the other Scandinavian were Lutheran. It wasn't until 1850 that the Danish constitution was amended to allow for freedom of religion. And that led to an opening for representatives of other religions to come in and proselytize. And among them were the missionaries, we say Mormon, uh, the official name of the church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The church leaders were actively sending out missionaries to, to the world. The church was uh, organized in 1830 and sent missionaries out immediately to the Eastern United States from New York. By the 1840s, they'd uh, gone to England and converted thousands there who'd come to, the, many of whom had come to the United States. By this time, the, the Latter-day Saints had been moved from New York to uh, Ohio, to Illinois, to Missouri, and finally bumped clear across the plains to Utah in 1847. But in 1850, despite their difficult circumstances in a new land, and they started sending missionaries out again. Erastus Snow was one, and uh, Peter O'Hanson, a Latter-day Saint who had joined the church in the United States. He was an American, but he had Danish ancestry. I think he might have been born in Denmark. They were the first missionaries to go to Denmark, and that was in 1850. And they had great success, and priests and other missionaries were sent. Professor Henriksen also discussed how the translation of the Book of Mormon to Danish made a huge impact on conversions in Denmark. Uh, you asked about the Book of Mormon, and that was uh, a new experience. Uh, when they uh, the first missionaries went to New England and uh, the United States and up into Canada, they preached in English, they spoke English. But when they got to Scandinavia, English wouldn't do. And so this was the, really the first experience in the church history where they, the missionaries had to learn new languages. Someone. Yeah, had to convert the, the Book of Mormon over into Danish. And Peter O'Hanson was the guy who did that. And that was part of his work, you know, get up every morning and translate a portion of the English Book of Mormon into Danish. I also asked why they likely joined the church and eventually decided to migrate to America. And I read the, uh, the history of Hans Westenskow, and he had some spiritual experiences, rather unusual, the violin floating off the wall, but a lot of people did have spiritual experiences. Others were attracted by the doctrine that was preached. They then, uh, in many cases, left their homeland and came to the United States and eventually to Utah, to Salt Lake City. That would be the, the arrival point. The first 10 or 15 years, there were 46,000 converts 
to the Latter-day Saint gospel. The first four principles of the gospel we say are faith, repentance, baptism, and the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is not too unusual in Christian churches. But they also added a fifth one, which was uh, gather to Zion. So there was a real need for people felt pressure and the need because of the Latter-day Saint idea that this is the latter day, these are the latter days, Christ is coming soon, and we need to gather to be in a safe place. 46,000 that converted, uh, at least 26,000 migrated to Utah. And in those days, Utah didn't have that many people. So this was quite an increase in the population. Eventually, they composed uh, 9% of the population, which is a pretty large minority. There are other reasons why they came. Economic, there were what we call push-pull factors. So some factors pulled them towards the uh, United States and Utah, like the promise of economic uh, success and the gospel, the gathering to Zion idea. There were other things like uh, persecution. Once they joined a non-Lutheran church, many of these people found they were persecuted or at least ostracized. My great-grandfather joined the church and worked uh, managing a brickyard. Owners of the brickyard said, well, if you want to be the manager of this brickyard, you have to have your children baptized in the Lutheran church. And so, so he eventually said, well, I'm going, I'll leave. And so the combination of factors led a lot of people to come to Utah. Hans's trip to Utah was only briefly mentioned in his own writings, but his sister Lena documented her own trip quite well in 1864. The Mormon missionaries helped fund Lena's trip with something called the Perpetual Emigration Fund. The group Lena traveled with had about 350 people altogether, all of whom were described as converts. They first sailed to England, taking a three-day trip which had heavy rain almost the entire time, making many of them sick. They landed on the east coast of England and took a train to Liverpool before continuing their journey to America. The ship to America had 974 passengers, and Lena described the ship's crew as rough and ill-tempered. Lena had befriended some girls from the group, but they were all conned on the trip by an elderly man who pretended to be a missionary and said they could entrust him to keep their valuables safe. Instead, after they gave him their valuables, he disappeared and was never seen again. After a grueling two-month journey, Lena's group landed at Castle Garden in New York. They then traveled by steamboat to Albany before taking a train west. The converts weren't well treated on this trip, and because this was during the Civil War, the group found themselves in cattle cars so the active soldiers could take the nicer cars. Once they arrived at the Missouri River, they took another steamboat up to Wyoming. In Wyoming, they then joined a company of immigrants led by missionary William B. Preston and then had to travel the last 1,000 miles on foot. Every once in a while, Lena would pull out her violin to play for everybody. Along the way, Lena fell in love with a man named Marcus Funk and they would be engaged before the trip's end. They finally made it to their destination on September 15, 1864, having started their trip on April 22, 1864 taking just under five months to travel about 5,200 miles. It was expected that the road to Zion would be a difficult one, that God's people should go through much tribulation to become purified as gold. With this understanding, all were determined to bear with meekness that which seemed to be their lot, going forward to their ultimate reward, a home in Zion. This was a pretty common experience for these Danish immigrants, but they did have somewhat of an idea before leaving of what to expect. To help them prepare for the travel and for assimilation, they had English classes in Denmark before they came. They also published guidebooks in Danish for them to help them know as they were traveling across the ocean and across the plains and so forth, what to expect, what to come prepared with. Most of them went on ships maybe to, to Liverpool which was a, a major disembarkation point from the continent or from, from Europe. The early ones, I guess, went on sailing ships, but more often in the later years, after the 1850s, they came on steamships. And they would arrive either in New York City or Boston, perhaps, 
And in many cases, they would go all the way down and then come up the Mississippi River to St. Louis. The early uh, arrivals had to walk or go by horseback or in wagons and the, the covered wagons we see in cowboy movies up until 1869. One interesting thing about the Danish immigration in the years before the railroad was that they were known for using hand carts, which were small wagons with no horse, no ox, just a man or a woman or both, <laughs> maybe their children pushing and pulling. There's a famous children's Mormon hymn called so, for some must push and some must pull as we go marching up the hill and, <laughs> and verily on our way we go until we reach the valley oh, as Hans had arrived almost exactly one year prior to his sister, Lena. Hans mentions in his autobiography that he paid for the passage of 13 others, 11 in Falster and two more in Liverpool. Hans's group arrived in Newark on June 13th, but weren't allowed ashore until June 15th. They quickly boarded a train to Albany and arrived one day later. The same day that they arrived in Albany, Hans's second son, Peter, was born. They then took a train to Florence, Nebraska, but not long after arriving in Florence, on July 2nd, Hans's first son, Ule, died at just over a year and a half old. Just four days after the death of their son, Hans and his family left Florence, Nebraska with the John Franklin Sanders Company. Hans's group finally arrived at their destination on September 5th, 1863. While it took these newcomers a little while to get set up, they were expected to become productive very quickly. Professor Henriksen told me about an interesting Brigham Young speech given to a group of new arrivals, which highlights this sentiment. Brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been chosen from the world by God and sent through his grace into this valley of the mountains to help in building up his kingdom. You are faint and weary from your march. Rest then for a day, <laughs> for a second day, should you need it. Then rise up and see how you will live. Be of good cheer. Look about this valley. Your first duty is to learn how to grow a cabbage, and along with this cabbage, an onion, a tomato, a sweet potato, then how to feed a pig, to build a house. The next duty for those who being Danes, French, and Swiss, but who cannot speak it now, is to learn the English language, the language of God, the language of the Book of Mormon, the language of the latter days. So they went to different places around the state. Often in, they went to a particular place because that's where they had friends or relatives this thing we call chain migration, where you go where someone that you know uh, from the old country usually lives and they'll uh, put you up and help you get settled for a while. The family made their way to the town of Manti in San Pete County, Utah, a town which is about 100 miles south of Salt Lake City. These newcomers faced a few challenges in their new homes and assimilating into the overall culture of the area, especially learning English. Professor Henriksen explained further. People who have studied this say, they faced three, three major enemies. Okay? One was the climate. They came from uh, Northern Europe. It was uh, a, a lot more moist there. It was cooler. Now they were in the great American desert. Another, was, uh, another enemy was the Native Americans, although they didn't have so much trouble getting along with them as they, as they thought they would. In fact, some of the Scandinavians learned more Indian language than they learned English, <laughs> especially the children. But the third enemy was the English language. And they, have, they really struggled with English, even though Danish and English are uh, rel related languages with a common Germanic ancestor. But English was very important for them to be able to integrate into the communities, become part of the, the, the kingdom of God in Utah. Brigham Young declared English was the language of God, I was mentioned here. Social linguists have noted that different re religious groups have often regarded the particular language as central to their faith. And so for these Latter-day Saints, English was very important. It was the language of the Book of Mormon. It was the language of the gathering. And so it was important for the Scandinavians to learn English and they wanted to, but uh, that doesn't mean it was easy for them, okay? Hans, Peter, and Lena would continue their work as musicians. And in 1866, Hans and Peter joined the militia as musicians to fight in Black Hawk's war. The war had started in 1865 but the conflicts between the Mormon pioneers and the Native Americans dated back to the 1840s. Relations between the pioneers and natives had been very peaceful at first. The Mormons wanted to be friendly and helpful to the natives because they saw it was in their own best interest. With Brigham Young once saying, it is cheaper to feed them than fight them. Even more so, the Mormons viewed Native Americans in a special light 
because the Mormons believed Native Americans were a lost tribe of Israel. Native Americans viewed the Mormons as outcasts and were initially friendly with these pioneers. Relations slowly soured over the years and multiple massacres happened throughout the 1840s and 1850s, with Mormon pioneers even taking some Native Americans as slaves, including women and children. By the time Hans and his siblings had arrived in Utah, hundreds of Native Americans had already been killed and enslaved, as well as eight Mormon settlers having been killed, four of whom had been Danish immigrants still on their journey from Denmark on a similar path that Hans took. Things really began to get worse in the summer of 1863, right before Hans and his family would arrive, and the family's first few years in Utah would include multiple fights between the settlers and Native Americans, eventually leading to Black Hawk's War. I basically found no reference to Hans and Peter's experiences in the war, with their biographies and obituaries mentioning this only as a small blurb. But their pension records show both of them served for one year and eight months as musicians. Hans and Peter continued their focus on music by running choirs, orchestras, and other musical organizations throughout the area. They were constantly discussed in the newspaper and played multiple large events. Hans even followed in his father's footsteps by teaching music to many students in the area and it is said that he taught all the early day musicians in the Mantai area. Hans and his wife Karen would have many children together, but at this time it was commonplace for men in the church to take multiple wives. Hans was urged by his wife to take a second wife, which he did in April 1869, marrying Karen Elizabeth Hansen, and it would be through this marriage that Drew descends from Hans. I also thought it was interesting that both of his wives were named Karen, and I imagine that must have been somewhat confusing throughout the house. Hans and his second wife would have multiple children together, including Drew's ancestor John Weston Scow. In looking for possible records for Hans' second marriage, I noticed that the registered date was actually October 10th, 1887. This seemed quite odd and I wanted to see if I could figure out why they would have a civil marriage 18 years after the original marriage. While I couldn't find anything indicating the exact reason, it seemed to be connected to the Edmunds Tucker Act of 1887. The Edmunds Tucker Act was a law which attacked polygamy by going after the LDS Church and the Perpetual Emigration Fund. This law was actually an extension of a previous law from 1882 known as the Edmonds Anti-Polygamy Act, which basically banned polygamy and took away rights from polygamists, including voting, holding public office, and even serving on juries. The 1887 laws were enacted due to the lack of control the previous law had over polygamy, so this new law disincorporated the church and the perpetual immigration fund. The Perpetual Immigration Fund was the same fund which helped finance Lena Weston Scow's trip from Denmark to Utah. This law also took away the rights of women to vote. That's right! In Utah from 1870 up until 1887, women had the right to vote. A law which had been passed by the Utah Territorial Legislator. The Edmunds Tucker Act included all women, not just those in polygamous marriages. I even found a public statement from famous women's suffrage fighter Susan B. Anthony opposing the bill and calling it obnoxious. One stipulation with this act was the requirement for civil marriage licenses. This is how I learned that it wasn't uncommon for Mormon couples to have a marriage recognized by the church, known as a celestial marriage, before they had a marriage recognized legally. The Edmunds Tucker Act became law on March 3, 1887, and Hans officially married his second wife Karen just seven months later in October of 1887. While I don't have confirmation that this is the reason, it seemed likely. Hans's first wife died in 1884, just three weeks shy of her 45th birthday. Hans's second wife took care of all the children, nine children from the first marriage and three children from the second marriage. William Weston Scow, the youngest son from the first marriage, wrote about his stepmother saying, I can truthfully say that she was always a good mother to us. 
Hans would begin working in the Mantai Temple in 1888, helping people with their genealogy. Hans's son William wrote that Hans was instrumental in obtaining genealogical records from the old country for many people in the area. In Hans's autobiography, he even boasts about having added over 2,000 names to the temple registry. And I think this adds a really interesting layer to the entire story in that a lot of the research and work Hans did in the temple likely helped preserve a lot of the family history researched for this video. Hans would work at the temple until his death in 1919 at the age of 83, where he was described to have died from natural causes. Hans's siblings, Peter and Lena, would also lead very fulfilling lives with many descendants and a strong legacy. Peter died in 1911 at the age of 73 due to a heart disease, having a total of 19 children with two wives, 11 through his first marriage and eight through his second marriage, with all but two making it to adulthood. Lena would die in 1928 at the age of 88 years old, having had 11 children with eight making it to adulthood. Drew had also done a DNA test, so I wanted to check out this line that we had built for the Weston Scow family against his DNA matches. Just using through lines, Drew had 18 genetic matches who also descended from Drew's third great grandfather, John Weston Scow. 42 matches through his fourth great grandfather, Hans Weston Scow, and 60 matches through his fifth great grandfather, Ule the most recent ancestor of Drew's on this line to have been born and died in Denmark, helping confirm everything we had built for this part of Drew's family tree. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out another episode of my YouTuber family tree series by clicking right here. Thank you to my Patreon patrons and YouTube members.